How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on Climate One, we sit down with the former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, and filmmakers Bonnie Cohen and John Shank to discuss their new documentary film, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. It was 2007 when An Inconvenient Truth mesmerized moviegoers with its shocking assessment of the climate crisis. Ten years later, Mr. Gore continues his fight. Ten years ago, when the movie An Inconvenient Truth came out, the single most criticized scene in that movie was an animated scene showing that the combination of sea level rise and storm surge would put the ocean water into the 9-11 memorial site, which was then under construction. And people said, that's ridiculous. What a terrible exaggeration. Vice President Gore, I watched an inconvenient truth, and then I watched an inconvenient sequel, and it seemed to me that in the first movie, you were speaking from your intellect lots of facts, and in this one, you're speaking much more passionately from your heart. Mm. Is that true? I don't know. I, uh, um, there's an old song written in Nashville by Chris Christopherson, sung famously by <laughs> Janis Joplin, with the line, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that applies. But it's also uh, down to the uh, incredible skill that Bonnie and John have with the cinema verite style. You know, if they asked to follow you around with cameras for two years of your life, uh, talk to me uh, first. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it, it, it actually it was a wonderful experience, but when I saw their first rough cut, I was really and truly astonished at a lot of the things that were on film where I had actually forgotten that they were around because they were always uh, around. <laughs> and uh, so I give the credit to them for, for, the, for uh, how great the movie is. I'm biased, but I think their talent is just really awesome. Rarely are sequels better than the first one. I think this is one of those examples. Uh, Bonnie Cohen, so how did you get him to open up? How did you convince uh, him you could, you could follow the vice president around for two years? And <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't give away those secrets. I'd have to, you know, I don't know what I'd have to do to you. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, when we first went to meet Al in Nashville, at his home in Nashville, and. Um, he was incredibly gracious southern gentleman that he is, and then <laughs> uh, proceeded to show us the 10-hour version of his slideshow, which is, <laughs> if you know the slideshow, I, it, it, it has kind of an accordion effect. It can expand and contract and expand further. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you give Al the opportunity, which we did because we needed to know everything, he, we got the full whack. So uh, it was... It was um, qu quite an experience. It was a life experience that we will never forget. We were going to be filming during the presidential campaign in this country. We were going to be filming in the run-up to the Paris Climate Conference. And so once we kind of established together that the way to go about this next film would be to get behind, the, do kind of a behind the scenes of the rock show with Al Gore, we had to convince Al. And uh, it was a, it, uh, it, it, it didn't take long for, I mean, this is a very savvy, media savvy individual we're dealing with here. And he, I think, Al, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Al understood very early on that those kinds of, authentic, the authenticity of those scenes would be undeniable. And that, you know, given where we are in the world where we unfortunately still are having to convince some people about the climate crisis and now go the next step to convince them about the sustainability revolution, um, that the authenticity of cinema verite was the way to go. So we kind of first spoke with him on an intellectual level and then, you know, John shot this beautiful movie in its entirety and is responsible for being that fly on the wall with Al in those scenes. So when things started to happen in a room, he's so engaged with whatever is going on that he, he did in fact forget what was happening and we were able to really capture um, authentic moments, emotional moments. 
And, and one area where that really comes through, John Schenck, is in Paris, where it's two weeks before the climate summit. Uh, Vice President Gore is doing this 24-hour kind of uh, video, and then something happens. Tell, set the scene for us in Paris. Yeah, a couple of weeks before the, the Paris climate uh, conference and th that was to take place in, in December of 2015, Al ha went to Paris um, in late November with the Climate Reality Project with the idea that he was going to do a 24-hour broadcast, broadcast around the world to raise awareness specifically for how important Paris was in, in, the, envi in the environmental history. Anyways, we were there, and that day happened to be the fateful day of the terrorist attacks in, that, that occurred in late November 2015. We were under the Eiffel Tower in the middle of the city, and we started hearing sirens and ambulances and police cars going by, of course wondering what the heck was going on. Everybody had their cell phones out, and you see in the film this, this drama unfold, essentially you as the viewer find out, as we found out that night, um, what occurred. And the interesting thing that happens is that, you know, people get very scared, of course. We really viewed it as kind of a, a key moment in the, in the plot of the film because Al, rightly so, identified this as an important moment where the media doesn't always connect the dots between current events that happen in the world. And of course, um, uh, you know, Al s steps up and gave, gave an incredibly emotional speech that night, kind of helping to comfort the French crew and telling the French that the Americans stood with them in, in that time of difficulty. But then kind of goes on to talk about the human condition and how in, in it's, it's in difficult times that people bind together. And it set a very kind of somber and serious but proactive tone going into the Paris climate uh, negotiations, which happened two weeks later. Up next on Climate One, Vice President Al Gore addresses his frustrations with climate change deniers and shares his thoughts on collusion. Bonnie Cohen, tell us about some of the scenes that didn't make it into the film that you wish you did. You could have fit in, but it didn't fit. We spent a lot of time on the Gore family farm in Carthage, Tennessee, which is it's an unbelievably beautiful part of the world, but uh, there's some very interesting work that, that Al is doing there, converting uh, his parents' tobacco farm into a sustainable, organic, um, working farm. It's, it, it's done, I mean, it's underway, it's working. They're putting vegetables out to um, communities uh, already. Supported agriculture. And supported agriculture, right. Um, we, we spent a lot of time there and actually feel a, a tremendous loss not having been able to put more of of that work into the film uh i would say um also there is you know there is you you visit al visits uh refu climate refugees in Tacloban in the philippines which it was mm -hmm. hit by uh superstorm hayan it was one of the worst uh storms to ever hit landfall and the destruction was um unbelievable and you know, we went around and, and Al met a lot of, there's a scene in the film where he meets uh, with some climate refugees, but he actually goes out into the um, villages and, and meets with a mother whose home was filled up to the top with water, which had never happened in the 40 years that she had her family had lived in this house. And it's a very kind of beautiful scene. And um, there's, you know, you have to leave a lot of these kinds of things on the editing room floor, unfortunately. Anybody that deals with the, uh climate crisis uh, and has had to wrestle with uh, climate denial, <laughs> if you're really serious about it, you end up delving, as I did, into neuroscience and be behavioral psychology. I've had days-long sessions with both of those groups. First things I learned is you have to keep those two groups apart, uh, by the way. <laughs> but but uh, it, it, it's certainly true. and. In, in almost every field, in economics, for example, or, or investing, uh, behavioral investing is now a really important field. As we are all learning more about how sometimes our e emotions and instincts will uh, cause us to leap to a particular conclusion and then use our rational minds to build a a sandcastle of uh, logic to justify the conclusion that we reached for other reasons anyway. And one of the frustrating things about uh, climate denial is that uh, the findings that so for some climate deniers, the more facts that you present, 
the more they get up their dukes and, and, and fight against those facts. This is association. I'll mention it now and get your response, initially respond. Whatever you th think first comes to mind, no filter. Vice President Gore, what comes to your mind when you hear collusion? <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> when you say no filter, I, you know, I spent a lifetime in politics. I mean, I, it's hard for me to remove the filter. But that's know, over now. First, first do no harm. I, I don't want to <laughs> say what really comes to mind. <laughs> okay. I guess. But you can probably guess. <laughs> All right, we'll take I that. I, I, more seriously, I think the next few months are going to be a real challenge for our country and we best gird ourselves for it and I'm heartened by the the slowly increasing number of Republicans who have said things that lead me to believe that they are going to be prepared if for example uh, uh, somebody was uh, uh, well I won't get into it but I, I think that I think there is now a chance that they will step up to the plate if, if uh, history and destiny call call them out a conservative columnist for the Washington Post, Jennifer Rubin, wrote recently, quote, the GOP's moral rot, end quote, is the real problem in Washington today. You know, uh, Jennifer Rubin, I think her column is called Right Turn. Yes. I've been reading her for quite a few years, and there have been so many times in the past where I thought, oh, you know, she's, I just don't really agree with that. But ever since the, when uh, Donald Trump emerged in the campaign, she became one of the uh, group of conservative Republicans who demonstrated to me that they had real solid integrity, conviction, values, principles. I wish more of them would join Jennifer Rubin's uh, point of view. But I really give her credit for, for the intellectual courage and 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 searing honesty to just, you know, burn whatever bridges she had to burn and tell the truth as she sees it. Now, for me, uh, so identified with the Democratic Party to endorse her statement, it wouldn't come across the same way, but yes. Uh, I want to quote you from Earth in the Balance. For anyone who's involved in the climate, it was very extremely prescient for the things, that was 25 years ago. Uh, but you opened that saying, quote, looking for a map to guide me on this journey, I reluctantly concluded that I had to look inside myself and confront some difficult and painful questions about what I am really seeking in my life and why. Mm. The search for the truths about this ungodly crisis and the search for truths about myself have been the same search all along. Yeah. Th thank you for uh, quoting that. There's a great uh, South American poet named Antonio Machado who wrote a famous line, Traveler, there is no path. You must make the path as you travel. This challenge is unprecedented. Uh, we've quadrupled population in the last hundred years. The technology revolution has given us tools that are infinitely more powerful than anything our grandparents could have imagined. And the short-term thinking with which we view the future consequences of present actions really blinds us to the full range of what we're doing and, and what it causes. So we do have to fall back on what's most important to us and shake off the distraction of modern culture, connect with one another on a human level, think about our grandchildren and the kind of world we want to leave to them, realize that when they are our age, they'll be asking one of two questions, either if they face, you know, the horrendous uh, apocalyptic consequences the scientists are now warning would occur if we did not take hold of this, if they might ask uh, justifiably, uh, what were you thinking and how could you have ignored our lives in the future? But if they live in a world with a sense of renewal, with tens of millions of new jobs being created, solar jobs are now growing 17 times faster than all other jobs in the economy. If they live in a world that is righting itself and restoring a, uh, an environment that is conducive to the flourishing of humankind, I want them to look back and ask, how did you find the moral courage to rise up and shake off the lethargy and distraction and do 
what's right. Coming up on Climate One, there's a twist in the United States withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. Former Vice President Al Gore reveals it next. Vice President Gore, there was a change to the film. There are some changes when uh, President uh, Trump took office. Uh, Almost choked on a that. Little <laughs> 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 it's a little hard to... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> so tell us how that changed your thinking and how it changed the film and changed a lot more. We really did not know for sure how the election was going to come out and whoever was elected, what that person would do on, on climate. Of course, there was a stark choice, but third, we didn't really know how those events would feel yeah. after they settled in. So they, uh, they wisely made the decision to, to, to wait in order to finish uh, uh, the film until we really knew what was going to happen, what had happened, and how it was going to feel. And actually, we knew that even after the festival premiere at, at Sundance, that there would have to be uh, changes uh, to the movie to incorporate the, the, uh, the, the new elements of the narrative uh, as they were unfolding. And a lot of that is, is really pulling out from the Paris Climate Accord. You issued a, a statement on that. That's part of the movie. How do you think the pullout from the Paris Climate Accord is going to affect that accord? Yeah, I was really worried when uh, Donald Trump made his statement. I had tried hard to uh, convince him in personal conversations, uh, starting in Trump Tower during the transition, continuing in the White House to stay in the Paris Agreement. I, I thought, th I really did think there was a chance he would come to his senses, but I, I was wrong about that. But <laughs> when he did make his speech, I was uh, deeply concerned that other countries might have used it as an excuse to pull out of the Paris Agreement themselves. But I was immensely gratified when almost immediately afterward the entire rest of the world redoubled their commitment to the Paris Agreement. Almost, <laughs> yeah. Almost as if they were saying, well, we'll show you Donald Trump. This is one of the things that, that we waited for after the film premiered at Sundance. Would Donald Trump make good on his promises to um, appoint uh, essentially fossil fuel executives and lobbyists and uh, to, to cabinet posts? And, and I think, I believe Pruitt was one of the, one of the yeah. first ones named. And now the, the best estimates uh, give rise to a legitimate uh, uh, hope that the U.S. is likely to meet the commitments made by former President Obama in the Paris uh, Agreement, uh, regardless of, of uh, Donald Trump. Now, the Paris Agreement, um, even with even if all of its commitments by all 194 nations uh, are kept, is still not not enough. We need to do more. But as the and and Bonnie and John document in the film how the cost of renewable energy, batteries, uh, electric vehicles, uh, efficiency improvements, all part of the broader sustainability revolution are coming down in cost so dramatically that uh, the world ha has the solutions now. And so w we have seen since the Paris Agreement amazing new commitments. India has just announced that within 13 years all of their cars and trucks are going to have to be electric vehicles, the new ones, which is an amazing, <laughs> and, and they, India and China are, are closing hundreds of coal-fired plants, vastly expanding solar and wind. So even, so I was uh, really heartened that the, the momentum generated around the world, not least by the Paris Agreement, uh, not least by the technology revolution, it is uh, now going to continue moving forward, uh, and others are, are, are coming to the rescue. Oh, one other point. The first day that the U.S. can actually legally leave the Paris Agreement, not entirely by coincidence, is the day after the 2020 presidential election. Uh, and, and so, and, the, and if there's a new president, um, the, the uh, 
a new president can simply give 30 days notice and rejoin the, the Paris Agreement. So um, we're going we're gonna to win this. The remaining question is whether we'll win it in time. Uh, regrettably, a lot of damage ha has been done. We still have the opportunity to avoid the catastrophic results for human civilization. But w we have to build on this momentum and increase it. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guest today at the Commonwealth Club is former Vice President Al Gore, who has a new book and film titled An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Bonnie Cohen and John Shank directed the film and joined our conversation. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time, everybody.